When I ask people, what is it that you dislike about working in groups? Why does it have such a bad reputation? Oftentimes the response that I'll get will be related to, you know, something along the lines of making any kind of decision in a group, trying to make any progress and move forward is like one of those battle royale events in the WWE where everybody's just trying to you know, throw everybody else out of the ring. You're all at cross purposes. Everybody's just trying to get their point across, get their, you know, solution to be the solution and and uh and, and it just becomes this this mass brawl right in trying to make a decision in a group but the, the truth is it doesn't have to be that way so uh, what i want to do in this video is talk a little bit about you know, making decisions in groups what's that like what's a you know uh an effective decision making process look like and 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 we'll go from there then right so uh, first of all there there are pros and cons of group decision making just like anything else in life there are good things about trying to work in a group and make decisions and there are bad things uh, and you know drawbacks to trying to do it this way first of all um, some of the advantages include uh, working from a larger pool right you're drawing from a larger pool like you've got more perspectives more ideas more knowledge more experiences everybody brings their thing so that's great you get you get to view any issue or whatever it is from lots of different angles and you get all kinds of perspective and all kinds of knowledge so you're drawing from a larger pool rather than just just your own experiences and your own limited kind of viewpoint on this issue you can also get synergy right we've talked about synergy before where one plus one doesn't equal two sometimes one plus one can equal three because you get people together and all of a sudden there something magical happens right where you get this synergy and on their output is greater than it would be even just with those two individuals working on it separately and putting it into the same pool when you work together on something you get that synergy you get this growth in it and, and the output can exceed what you would expect from the individual output of even just these two people so or more people so you can get this synergy that happens in group decision making people push one another and and really uh, bring out the best of one another and, and so anyway it, you know, it can be more enjoyable for the group members when you, when you have group decision making, it can be more enjoyable. It just brings more um, enjoyment to the group members <clears throat> in terms of uh, it helps them feel a part of something and, and they're, they're contributing. And um, for all kinds of reasons, it just makes group work more enjoyable at times. It can when you when you have an effective decision making process in place I can make things easier to implement. Right? Many hands make light work. So you get more people in on it and, and implementing whatever decision it is, you can, that work can be spread out over multiple people. You don't have to do it all by yourself. So uh, it can make whatever decision you do make easier to implement when you, when you do so in a group and when you're working in a group. And it also provides less individual pressure when you are the one making the decision all on your own. Of course, then everything is on your shoulders. Uh, if it goes right, goes well, then great. But if it doesn't, man, you're, you're in either way up till that point when you find out whether it's going to work out or not, you're feeling a lot of pressure and it is all on you. Whereas if you make this decision as a group, gosh, you're in this together, right? And so you share that responsibility, you share that burden, you share that, that kind of stress. It, it's spread out a little more across the group and you're not just in it uh, all on your own. So it's less individual pressure when a decision is made by a group than when it's made by an individual. There are some disadvantages to group decision making, and these won't surprise anybody, I don't think. But uh, <clears throat> there are process losses. There are things, you know, that that it can take time. You know, it's easy when you're making the decision by yourself. It's one step, right? You decide, and decision is made, right? But when you're making decision in a group, it can be a process. There, are, there are ways that uh, that things can be slowed down. It can feel like you're trying to run a molasses, right? And so that that you can have those kind of process losses when you're making decisions in a group. You also see the emergence of social loafing, which is something we've talked about uh, extensively in previous videos. But you see that, of course, more when you're working in a group. You don't see that in individuals, obviously. Um, the presence of groupthink, which we're going to talk about here more extensively in just a few minutes. But uh, again, groupthink doesn't happen in individuals. Groupthink ha happens in groups, obviously, right? So, um, so groupthink can be uh, something that emerges as part of group decision making. And of course, it can take longer when you're trying to, again, when you're making a decision, it can be quick and easy. And, and you know, in terms of uh, time, you just make that decision and you move forward. When you're working in a group, it can take time to make a big decision in a larger group. The larger the group, the longer it's probably going to take. You're going to need to get input from everybody. And anyway, just the whole process is stretched out a little bit. Okay, so there are some disadvantages, of course, but in truth, the advantages typically outweigh the disadvantages if it's handled properly. Right? If you're if you're in a 
in a group that has a positive climate and you're doing things appropriately in that group and it's a positive experience, then then the advantages of group decision making will far outweigh the disadvantages in those situations. Okay, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Let's talk about some methods for group decision making just real quickly here in a, in a kind of across the spectrum. What are some different ways that groups make decisions? First of all, we have kind of a, it's going to sound kind of funny, but the first one is called the plop, right? Really, which is no decision. You get to the end of the meeting and people just kind of will go their own directions. They go their own way with no real decision made. Maybe you'll come back to it later. Uh, you know, maybe you won't, but maybe the decision is just no decision. And so it's just called, you know, the plop for whatever reason. I, so, um, but yeah, people just basically kind of walk away and, and that's the end of it for that, at least for that moment. Right. Um, another option is decision by expert. If you have somebody who has specific expertise in this area, real knowledge, real expertise, uh, far and beyond what the other group members would have, then maybe you defer to that person and you say to them, um, look, you know this best, so we're going to follow your lead. You know what you're doing here. So um, so you have a decision by expert where you just rely on that person's expertise and, uh, and, and, and move forward um, in the way that they should kind of determine. You also have what we call averaging, which is sort of a meet in the middle type approach, right? This works. Uh, especially well, or, or not, not well necessarily, but it's especially easy to fall into in some cases when you have something that's quantitative or measurable in terms of numerically measurable, right? You can just say, well, you want 20 and we want 10. So let's just say 15, you know, we'll just, you know, we'll come to the, come to a, you know, agreement on the middle there and we'll average it out and just say, okay, 15 is the, is the way we'll go. Right? Now that's harder to do if it's not something that's quantifiable or numeric. Um, but you know, in those situations where it is, you can average it out and maybe that, maybe that'll work um, potentially. I'm not saying it's the best method, but it is a, a method for decision-making. Um, one, you know, is voting. We live in a democracy here in America, right? Or at least a democratic Republic. Right? So we're, we're big on voting. Let's say, you know, majority rules, but you know, what if the majority of the people are, are, are wrong or don't know anything about that topic and they're just going on whatever there's, there's issues with voting too, but but it can be a way to just kind of move things forward. And, and when you get down to it, it's, you know, I suppose as fair as anything, but, uh, but you don't always get the best decisions when you end up with voting, right? Because, um, um, what if everybody doesn't, and like I say, have that full picture or doesn't have the, the full, um, facts or doesn't have the expertise or the, the knowledge required to make an, an effective decision in that situation. Anyway, there's, um, so voting is an option, but it may not always be, shouldn't be your first stop. I don't think. Right. So, um, then we have the option of also what we call consensus. Right? This is probably, you know, as far as decision-making goes, the ideal you know, method theoretically would be consensus where you all work together and, and come to an agreement on what the best possible solution is going to be here. And yet everybody on board, it's not a voting, it's not majority rules. It's everybody is on board. Right? Everybody agrees that this is the way we want to do things. And this is the way we want to move forward. Now, as you can imagine, of course, that sounds great, right? You know, in a utopia, in a perfect world, everything would be done by consensus. We would all just agree on things, right? We'd, uh, you know, come to, to the same decision and move forward as one. That can be more difficult than it sounds, right? We all we all know that, that consensus is not always easy. Right? So uh, what can we do, first of all, to, to reach consensus? And, and if it is the best method, ideally, then, uh, then how can we go about doing that? So let's, let's take a look at that for a minute. How do we go about seeking consensus? Um, and what's the, the most effective method to make sure we're truly reaching consensus in these situations? First of all, we want to ensure that everyone is on the same page. Everyone has all of the information and has had all of their questions answered and that uh, that we are um, fully on board with with what's happening and the direction that we're heading and that everybody's truly comfortable with that and um, and that we're you know we want to make sure that everybody's understands what we're talking about understands the details of what the decision involves and what's going to be required of them and what the end result would be what success looks like so all, we just want to make sure everybody is on the same page has all the information possible and uh, and that nobody has any remaining questions then right we also want to be sure that we're getting full participation just because somebody is quiet doesn't mean they don't have an opinion on that. Right? So we want to make sure that we're getting full participation, that we're really working to pull everybody into this process so that everybody has ownership and, and everybody has kind of a stake in this and everybody is, is involved and feels like, you know, they were a part of that decision 
And that, like I said, get ownership of everybody and get full participation. That's important when we are seeking consensus. We want to be sure that we're listening well, that we're employing effective listening skills. And that's that goes beyond just being quiet when somebody else is talking. We want to make sure that we're actually listening to them, that we are uh, understanding what we're what they're saying, that we're hearing, you know, that we're understanding what they're saying, that we're interpreting it uh, appropriately and correctly, that we're evaluating it, that we're really taking it in and making sure that it that it makes sense what they're saying to us. We're evaluating that. Um, that we are then um, kind of, you know, uh, uh, remembering what it is they say as, as we build on these ideas that so we're remembering. And then we're repeating back to them and we're responding, not just repeating, but responding to these people. And, and uh, so that we, un we demonstrate that we understand these things. So we need to listen effectively and really demonstrate that we uh, are listening and, and really employ effective listening skills in these situations. We're going to have to be patient. Consensus is not an easy process all the time, so we've got to be patient. We've got to be willing to put in the time and uh, and the energy into this process and really just be patient with the way that things are, are going to unfold and, and give it time to do so. Right? And we need to pursue true collaboration. Now, remember, collaboration, you know, we talk about compromise a lot, but compromise means somebody's giving, both parties are giving up something, right, in compromise. So uh, we want to seek True collaboration, meaning that everybody's getting everything that they want out of this and that everybody's satisfied with that. That's going to be the best for the long term um, health of that decision for the group. And we want to res resolve, <coughs> excuse me, resolve gridlock earnestly, meaning if we're, if we're at odds, you don't want to just say, OK, let's just draw straws or let's flip a coin or let's, you know, whatever these kinds of things. You want to make sure that you're coming out of gridlock where you're at odds, which is OK. It's OK if you have conflict over ideas. You want to be sure that you're resolving that, though, fully and uh, and resolving it earnestly in the sense that uh, that you're not just, again, skipping, you know, skipping some steps and flipping a coin and and saying, well, you know, that's just how it's going to be. Then our voting even in that situation would not be ideal because then. Somebody still feels left out. Somebody's hurt. And that's not consensus. You want everybody moving in the same direction the whole time. Right? So you got to resolve that gridlock on, earnestly. Be willing to put in the time, be patient, listen well, and resolve any of those uh, conflicts or, or that gridlock um, earnestly and be serious and be committed to that. So is all of this easy? No, absolutely not. Is it always worth the time? No. If you're just deciding, you know, what to have for lunch then spending, you know, three days seeking consensus isn't isn't the right idea. Right. But if it's a major decision for this group and it impacts everyone and it has, a, you know, it's going to have a, a, a wide reaching effect, uh, this decision will on the overall um, outcome of this project, then it is worth the time uh, to 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 pursue consensus and to really uh, come to consensus so that you have everybody on the same page. I mentioned a moment ago that uh, groupthink can be one of the disadvantages to group decision making. And we've discussed groupthink a little bit in previous videos, but I want to spend a little more time on it here as part of this discussion. So uh, groupthink is the practice of thinking or making decisions as a group and in a way that discourages creativity or individual responsibility. So, you know, it's this mindset of just, you know, go along and we get this momentum going where people just feel the need to to go along and to follow along and that, uh, that, you know, uh, and we're doing this together. So we must be in the right. right? So groupthink can uh, be an issue in, in many group settings. So we need to guard against it. So what are some of the symptoms of groupthink? Some of the, the things that if we note these things, then we may be falling into that trap of groupthink. Um, first of all, the illusion of invulnerability, uh, the illusion of invulnerability. So you think back when you were, you know, in your younger years and you know, maybe your early teen years, 13, 14, 15, and you just felt invincible, right? There was nothing that could harm you. No bad thing could happen to you, really. And as a result, you just took maybe some more extreme risks. You know, as a, as a young boy, I know we spent a lot of time jumping off of things or riding our bikes off of things and doing things that we were just ludicrous looking back. That, But we just felt like there's no way we were going to get hurt. We couldn't be hurt. We were young and, and we were going to live forever. So... Uh, we did these things that had extreme risks. Well, the same thing happens in groupthink um, when you have this collective again, momentum going forward and it creates this excessive optimism and this feeling that you can take extreme risks because um, you're in the right and nothing bad can happen to those who are who are in the right. Right. So um, we have this illusion of invulnerability. We also have collective rationalizations. 
This is where uh, members downplay negative information or warnings. So any red flags that may come in, any, you know, sirens going off that say, you know, maybe this isn't quite right. Then we collectively just downplay that we figure out a way to, to excuse those things or to downplay that information or avoid that information because we don't want the cognitive dissonance. We don't want to reconsider those assumptions. We we just want to be safe in our group knowledge that we are in the right and, and nothing can violate that, right? There's also an unquestioned belief in the group's inherent morality. This idea that this group is absolutely right. There is, again, no possible way that we could be wrong. That What we are doing is, you know, if not, if not, a, you know, a proviso of something that's handed down from God on high, something close to it, right? That we are in the absolute right and, and there's nothing that can touch that. So anything else, any other, you know, legal, ethical, moral consideration really can be put to the side because the ends justify the means. What we are doing is so right that nothing else can really be wrong in that sense. And, and that even if it is considered wrong in some sense, it's ultimately right because what we are doing is right on the whole. Right. So with this in, unquestioned belief in the, in the morality of what we're doing leads us to set aside any other kind of legal, ethical, moral consideration. Uh, then we also have a stereotyped view of outgroups. So this idea that anybody who is not one of us, who's not part of our in-group, is part of that out group and this is them this is what's wrong with them they discount um these people's the, the out group's abilities their their arguments their again their morality is questioned so um so they can't be right so they we have the stereotype you anybody who is not one of us is part of the problem and so they get stereotyped they get lumped into this group right? and so we um we just don't even consider what they're saying because they're so wrong there's no way they could possibly even be close to right. Uh, another symptom is direct pressure on any member who expresses um, strong arguments against the group's stereotypes, illusions, or commitments. So anybody who has the goal, anybody within the group who has the, the, the wherewithal to say, not, you know, I'm not so sure about this. Boy, we just pile on them, right? On group thing. We just put that direct pressure on them to say, no, you are wrong. And, uh, and so you need to put that away and just fall in line. So we get that direct pressure from other group members on anybody who expresses any kind of um, question or, or um, concern about what's happening. We start to see self-censorship. So members start to uh, keep quiet if they do have those doubts, if they do have um, questions or, or counter arguments that they might present, they don't do so. They censor themselves and say, look, I need to just keep this to myself. Obviously I'm wrong and the group is right. So, uh, but we start to see that self-censorship people keeping quiet about things that they maybe could or should speak up about. The illusion of unanimity, where we just have this illusion that, that everybody is in total agreement. So when you have self-censorship and nobody is saying anything to the contrary, and when they do, you get that direct pressure. So you're not seeing it certainly as much and it's not, you know, loudly being heard. Um, then that lack of dissent is viewed as unanimity. Uh, where, you know, we just say, well, nobody's speaking up against it, so we must all be right, which just feeds into that idea of what we're doing is right and so forth. It's just kind of, again, all of this feeds on itself uh, when we get caught in this sort of vicious cycle of groupthink. And then finally, the emergence of self-appointed mind guards. Mind guards. This is where one or more of the members then protect, protect, I'll put that in quotes, air quotes there, protect the group from information that runs counter to the group's assumptions and course of action. So again, anything that um, might suggest that what the group is doing is not 100% right, then these mind guards find a way to keep it from the group. They protect the group, uh, so to speak, from that information, right? And they encourage people not to, you know, don't listen to the other viewpoints. Don't listen to that news. Don't read that newspaper. Don't read that article. Don't, you know, this is all nonsense. It's all lies. So just uh, avoid this information. So. These mind guards, self-appointed, by the way, these self-appointed mind guards work actively to keep other group members from um, viewing or, or seeing that information, encountering it in the first place, right? and, and anything that would dissuade them from the group's course of action. So those are those different symptoms of, of group things. Just to apply this for a second, in reality, I, and I hate to, to get political and for the 
you know, just for the record, I'm a, I'm a libertarian, so I, I'm not affiliated with either political parties. I'll just say this about both major political parties right now. I see a lot of the elements of groupthink at work in our major political parties right now, uh, in both of them. And I'll just say it that way, both of them, absolutely. Um, I think they are invulnerable. They have these extreme views. They take these extreme risks and, and go to these extremes because they think they are invulnerable, because they think they have the, the moral, uh, the, the, you know, the, they have the uh, kind of um, monopoly on morality, so to speak, right? Both parties think they do, that they are absolutely in the right and they rationalize away any counter arguments when you present counter arguments to folks in, in you know, that are so caught up in, in the, the, the wave of either of these parties, they just kind of explain away these things, whether it makes any sense or not. And they absolutely stereotype the other side. You see that on both sides. You know, you see Republicans stereotype Democrats as liberal, communist, socialists, whatever, you know, that want to do, you know, all their policies. There's a wide range of views within the Democratic Party. There's also a wide range of view within the Republican Party, right? We stereotype all Republicans as basically Trump acolytes at this point, right? And they all are the same. Oh, we know that that's not the case. There, there are certainly those that are, but, uh, but that's not everybody in that party, not everybody in either party. So we stereotype them. We put pressure on any, any member of the party who dares to speak otherwise. Um, so uh, if you're not totally on board, then you must be part of the problem. You see the self-censorship where people, even if they do have doubts, they certainly don't want to go against the, the grain and get you know pounded down by all those people putting pressure on them. So they, they keep quiet about it, whatever concerns that they do have. Right? Uh, this sense of unanimity then emerges because nobody's speaking up and saying, well, you know, maybe that isn't quite right. And you have the mind guards, and I see this most at work in the media, where people who are, uh, you know, on the Democratic side of things, first of all, say, well, you can never watch Fox News. You should never watch Fox News, and vice versa. People on the on the right say, well, you should never watch MSNBC. There's nothing good there. There's nothing, you know, it's just full of lies and things. So, uh, so you have these mind guards that tell people, don't do this. When in reality, it would do us all some good to get some perspective from the other side, you know. Again, I don't necessarily agree with either of these parties, or, and so the major media doesn't really interest me from either of these, but I'd make it a habit to watch MSNBC some, and to watch Fox some, and to watch CNN some, because I want to get those different viewpoints. But mind guards would have us say, no, you should only watch the one that works for our party and, and that says what we want to hear. And we get caught in this echo chamber then, right, with the media, and it feeds into this as well. Uh, and so we get sucked into this groupthink politically where you know, we got to be one or the other. It's it's an either or proposition, right? Well, no, it's not. There are other options available even within those parties. Uh, so, but but we see this at work a lot of times in political parties. Just one example. We see groupthink at work in all parts of life and all aspects. But to me, at least at the moment, it just is especially evident in our political parties that, that they have been caught up in this in this groupthink uh, mentality and this, this momentum and wave of groupthink. So, you know, making decisions in groups, as we talked about, is it can be a challenge. It can be difficult, but it can also be worthwhile. We see that better decisions get made out of groups because you bring in different perspectives. It, it uh, spreads out that, that pressure that people feel in making a decision. There are just all kinds of benefits for making decisions in groups. So are there challenges? Absolutely. But are they, or do those benefits outweigh those challenges? Yes, in the, in, the, in the right circumstances, when this group is doing important long-term work, then, uh, then it absolutely is worthwhile to, to get it right. If you have questions about the decision-making process in groups and how to make it go more effectively, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. And in the meantime, I just hope this gives you some new perspective on um, the possibilities that exist within group decision-making and some ways that we can uh, make that process work for us in a constructive way.